I'm glad you're here, and I hope you had a great holiday weekend. We have a quorum, which is not necessary. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and get started. I've had a couple of days of rest, can you tell? Um, okay, good afternoon, everybody. Seriously speaking, um, I think this is, this goes without saying, this is a really cool little thing we've got here going on. There's with the missing mics, I'm pretty excited about that. So we will start with announcements, and we will start, we'll start with Ms. Krogh. All right, I do have a few. Um, a couple weeks ago, I participated in an event called the Military Child Education Coalition's Living in the New Normal, mouthful. Um, I was invited by um, Congressman Jim Cooper to sort of represent the education uh, piece. Um, it was a huge statewide event, and it was um, targeted toward uh, finding ways to support our military children and identifying their unique needs. And I learned that we have over 1,500 uh, military children here in Davidson County alone. Um, and it was a really well old event. Uh, I've made me start thinking, how can we implement a procedure like this for you know some other issues, maybe for reduced lunch children in our school? But uh, it was just uh, attended by a lot of different people across the state. And um, we did some, some visionary work and goal setting. Uh, so I was very honored to be a part of that event. Um, and the graduation ceremonies were great. Everyone was right about how fun that was to attend those. Um, I just had a couple of some amazing news that I, that, at the different uh, graduations I attended. Um, I learned just through the grapevine at our Hillwood graduation that our salutatorian scored a 35 on his ACT and got a full red to brown. Wow. <laughs> wow. And this was not mentioned anywhere. Yeah, you know? and then through the grapevine also learned that the valedictorian at um, Hillsborough, I'll speak for Michael since he's not here, also got a 35 on the ACT and got a full ride to UT Knox School on the honors program. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of good things going on that we might not even be aware of in our schools and I want to say congratulations to all the graduates and parents and uh, schools for the good work this year. Mr. Pinkston. Thank you, Madam Chair. On uh, May 7th, I had the honor of attending a breakfast celebrating the 20th anniversary of the bridge, Nashville. Uh, the bridge program uh, started in 1993 with a mission to, quote, get older kids into teaching and younger kids into learning. Uh, two, two decades later, the bridge has built a real legacy of preparing seventh graders all the way through high school for academic excellence and college success. I want to thank the bridge's founders, my friends, Mary Jane and Gilbert Smith, for their love He's of this community and their support of public education. Uh, our kids and our city are better because of them and everyone who's part of the bridge. Um, also, want to thank my friends, uh, T.C. Weber, Irene Kelly, Debbie Young, and all the organizers and volunteers for the 6th Annual Flat Rock Festival, uh, which uh, went down last Saturday. Uh, this year's festival focused on public education, the Grand Marshals, were Clint Cliff High School Principal Clint Wilson and Wright Middle School Principal Judd Haney. Clint and Judd and their teams and uh, the teachers are doing great work serving the most diverse student populations in the city. It makes me proud, as always, to represent South Nashville on the school board. Finally, briefly, a nod to my neighbor, Alex Weber. Alex just graduated from Hillsborough High School. He had all sorts of amazing college opportunities, uh, UT, Ball State, University of North Carolina. Ultimately, he accepted the Jim Barney Scholarship to attend UCLA. Uh, Alex, who has been a leader in Hillsborough's theater productions and comedy improv, is the first MNPS student selected by the Barney Scholarship Committee. The Barney Scholarship is valued at $55,000 per year. It's open to high school students from Tennessee and Kentucky who aspire to a career in theater or drama. Um, as you all may know, Jim Barney died in 2000 from lung cancer, but he will always be remembered for his comedic characters, including near the end of his career, uh, the voice of Slinky Dog and Disney's Toy Story. So I'm proud that my neighbor Alex Weber is the winner of this year's Barney Award. We're sorry he won't be in Tennessee, but we know he's going to do great things on stage and in life. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Shepard. I'll just echo uh, Ms. Folk's comments about the graduations. The ma graduation marathon is always a lot of fun, and um, no matter how many different schools that you attend, their graduation, they're all different, and they're all very gratifying. So that's, that's the fun part of the job that I absolutely love. Hi, Ms. Kim. Hi, Any announcements? No, but is this the new technology that made me This is <laughs> This is super, super cool, and very sensitive, I'm told. Oh, I shouldn't <laughs> have. <laughs> I have no announcements. Ms. Bearing. Yes, as we bring this year to a close and my first academic year on the board, 
uh, I now understand how exciting uh, you guys, all the, the kudos that you have given to graduation because it was truly the highlight of my time on the board. And uh, especially, I uh, wanted to thank Michael Hayes and Dr. Terry Schrader for sharing the stage with me at Hillsborough High School where my grandson graduated uh, last week. And that was really a thrill to be on stage with him. Uh, I've heard from um, uh, Sue Kessler at Hunter's Lane about their end of course exams that they took last week and I just wanted to share some of those with you. Their English 1 scores are up 11% from last year. Their English 3 is up 24% from last year. Algebra 1 is up 70% from last year. Algebra 2 is up 174%. And biology is up 110%. So uh, much to celebrate at Hunter's Lane. And congratulations to Dr. Sue Kessler and the Ozark Dr. Brennan? Okay. Um, and just, uh, I'll say this again, I'm sure uh, we won't get tired of hearing this, graduation was phenomenal. Um, I was lucky enough, and I counted them, to shake over 1,600 hands. And that's a lot of students when you think about it, but it was absolutely amazing. And I was very excited because I got to participate in uh, Hume Fogg's um, parade to the Bridgestone Town. That was very, very exciting, very exciting. Um, we had a lot of students graduate, and I will say that I would love to um, give kudos to the academies um, because we have started to outgrow our graduation locations with the number of students that are graduating from the academies, Hickory Hollow, Opry, Opry Mills, and Old Cockrell. We're outgrowing that space, and that's fantastic. That means that we're getting a lot of students back into the system and graduating them, as opposed to them just going out into the world um, and not coming back. Um, so great things are happening at MNPS, and that's very exciting for us all. I'm glad you all got to experience the graduation season. It is uh, far and beyond the best thing that we do. It gives us a, a real purpose for what we do. So. Um, thank you all for that. Um, and now we'll go on with our, oh, one quick, oh, we did change it. Budget update is going to be first or second? Second. Second. Budget update is going to be second. You, on your agendas, it shows as first, but we're going to move it to uh, after the strategic plan. So, Dr. Register. Thank you. Uh, good to see all of you. Thank all of you for, and I want to say, I'll echo uh, another word or two about graduation ceremonies. Thank all of you for being so uh, involved in those there. I, I, I do quite a few. It, it is a marathon in a way, but uh, it's a great, a, a great weekend, a great week for us to recognize thousands of young people who have graduated from our school system. So uh, thank you all for participating the way you did. Uh, I will say uh, that uh, individual principals are getting test scores back now and I'll let I'll ask Paul to clarify that but really what you get back now is is informal the principals uh, count their that this called quick score uh, we get scores back on individual students so that they can report at the end of the year but we don't have anything official back from the state until probably up in July this is what we anticipate uh, at this point in time so uh, we, uh, we have two uh, topics to cover tonight, and I'm uh, very pleased to uh, ask a couple of our folks to uh, give you an update on the strategic planning process and uh, district goals. Uh, <clears throat> I want to do just a very brief introduction, if I may, about, about where we are with this process, and then uh, turn it over to uh, Lisa Wilshire and Tamla Fentress, and then to Paul Chambers to talk about uh, system-wide goals uh, that, that are included as a part of a strategic plan. We actually started uh, uh, working on this strategic plan after the first of the year, uh, January, February. It was really February until, until we got a start on it. And uh, it was uh, an attempt to update our strategic plan from the original MNPS Achieves from the uh, comprehensive transformational reform strategy that we've had going on in the district for over three years now. Um, at, at the height of that work, at the planning process, uh, we counted somewhere around 65 strategic initiatives that were going on in our district through those nine transformational leadership groups in the district, a very comprehensive 
uh, reform strategy. Uh, and we've gone from uh, three, three and a half years ago, four years ago, where that was uh, uh, very much a planning process to where we've moved much more toward a, an implementation process now. Uh, and it's, it's uh, time uh, to really update our strategic plan uh, to focus, to refine, to narrow uh, that original set of initiatives to those high yield strategies that we want to uh, develop going forward. Uh, and, and the process, it's, so, it's a, so the point I want to make is it's really an inductive process, moving from a very broad set of strategies and, and planning that, that's been going on in the district to a much more narrowly focused set of strategies and a communications device. A strategic plan is a communications piece, a strategic communications piece to talk about where our district's going, where our goals are, where we're headed in the future. So, so it, it, and, and at this point in time, we're not through with it. We're, we're getting close uh, uh, to developing something as an administrative staff to present in, in a comprehensive format uh, to the Board of Education. We hope to be able to do that in July. But uh, at this point in time, I've, I've become impatient with uh, getting out uh, performance goals. Uh, somewhat tied to the performance framework that you have, an evaluation of individual schools, uh, and we're looking at uh, performance goals for our district. I know Mr. Pinkston's talked about board goals, and, and all of this ties together uh, at this point in time. Uh, the central office reorganization, a, a, a board dashboard, the superintendent's evaluation, and the academic performance framework. So we tried to give you in your uh, email a, a little bit to give you uh, somewhat of a, a framework about where we are, but what we'd really like to do tonight is focus on those performance goals, that piece of it. And uh, uh, we, I've asked uh, Lisa and Tamara and Paul to come and uh, uh, give you an update on that at this point in time. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Lisa to say a few words and then Tamara and then Paul. Okay, well, good evening, Madam Chair, Board Members, and Dr. Register. Um, before we actually move into the presentation of our um, draft strategic plan goals, I wanted to direct your attention to what's on the screen, but also in front of you, there is a worksheet called um, Alignment Worksheet, and it has a visual for you. And this is really a schematic that illustrates how the strategic plan, um, the board dashboards, and the division strategic action plans are aligned. So this visual is intended to provide a picture for you um, of how the strategic plan that we're creating right now really sets the coherence for all of the moving parts in the system. Um, so you'll see at the top, we've got the MMPS vision and mission um, as approved and adopted by the board in 2009. Um, and then the strategic plan, and this is what the leadership at MMPS has been working on now for several months. As Dr. Register noted, it's, a, it's been an inductive process. So this is not the creation of a new strategic plan. Um, really, to use research language, this has been kind of a meta-analysis of the work that's gone on over the last three to four years with MMPS Achieves and the TLGs. Um, the system reform efforts, the race to the top implementation of uh, some strategies, common core teacher evaluation and other system level changes, um, some school level reports we got from tribal, um, the visioning that was done when we wrote the race to the top district grant in the fall, as well as the central office restructuring this year has all been a part of this process. So all of the work has been really cumulative and an evolution. Um, built on the progress and the success as well as the challenges um, that we've faced in implementation over the last few years. And uh, as Dr. Register said, what this five-year strategic plan does is really uh, tighten the focus on those most important priorities that are really going to accelerate student success. Um, everything in the plan is directed toward goals for student outcomes. Um, the student is what is central and really the North Star of all of the efforts. Um, outcomes for students are really the system's ultimate goal. So that's where you'll see the grow, achieve, and power there in the middle. And we'll talk about more, we'll talk about that more in detail when we go through the, the plan's <laughs> goals. But 
really what this means is, you know, we want our students to demonstrate growth in academics as well as uh, social emotional development. We want our students to achieve academically. And we also want our students to really own their own learning and instill that love of learning um, and engagement with learning processes and experiences and motivation to pursue goals. And that's what's encompassed in the Empower. So that was really the, our frame of reference in terms of where we orient all of our work. Um, because we believe all three are critical for success. For today's work session, you'll see that shaded. What we're really going to focus on are um, the, the system level goals. So you can th think of this as a part one in a several part process that we'll, we'll discuss uh, and bring the plan forward to you as it's developed. Um, but today, we wanted you to be aware of the progress that's been made and um, the goals as they exist now, which are critical for the system. Underneath that, you'll see the boxes for strategies. And th that's really um, the priority levers of change that we believe are going to help get us there, which we are not going to discuss today. That'll be brought forward in part two. Um, again, today will just be focused on the goals. But notice that everything above that dotted line is really about the system as system level goals, system level strategies, and system performance. Um, on the left, where it says dashboard, that's the alignment Dr. Register was talking about in terms of the director of schools evaluation. And I think it's important to note that there's going to be frequent monitoring of progress and results um, in areas that we really believe contribute to student outcomes. And these were really born from the beliefs um, as adopted by the board and the director of schools, synthesized with the thinking and progress over the last few years. So this includes the academic performance framework, which is really that comprehensive monitoring of school performance. Um, again, very tightly aligned with the strategic plan, because as we improve the performance of schools, student performance improves. Um, and as a system, this is, a, this is our mechanism for accountability and a really essential means to uh, both support leaders and to hold leaders accountable for their work. So here you'll also see collaborative culture, which we think is essential to progress, which is that increasing professional capital, distributed leadership, the district community collaboration that started with MNPS Achieves and has continued through initiatives like the Academy Business Partnerships and Community Achieves, and the equity and diversity, which really keeps us informed about our progress with system level reforms such as inclusion for English language learners and special needs students, as well as the recently adopted board diversity plan. So there are important, um, there's important monitoring that we want to stay on top of as a system, but we really believe all of this is contributing to the student outcomes, which is what's central to all of this. So everything below the dotted line, which is very tightly connected, is really kind of where the action occurs. So this, these are the divisions, strategic action plans for all the divisions in the organization. You'll see those listed there. So this is where the actual implementation of the strategic plan happens, driven by each of the division's SMART goals. Um, so every project or initiative, like the 65 Dr. Register mentioned, um, are tied to the division's goals, which are in turn linked to the strategic plans, goals, and measures and strategies. Um, so again, our focus for today is the system level goals, which does not represent everything we're going to track. Um, there are many submetrics and disaggregated metrics that we will track. Um, but these are just the goals that are central to the system as a whole with the student at the center. Um, so before we actually move into the, um, the presentation that outlines the goals, I, I want to see if there's any questions so far about this alignment worksheet. And if not, I will pull up the, um, the PowerPoint. We'll go ahead and start working through here. And you can see on the first slide um, our district vision, uh, which has not changed. Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools will provide every student the foundation of knowledge, skills, and character necessary to excel in higher education work and life. 
um, that's a central anchor point for us. And um, you will also see there a mission statement that Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools will transform all schools into high-performing schools that demonstrate excellence through the academic, social, and emotional success of every student. Every graduate will be prepared for college and career. And this is the driver for, for everything that follows. Um, this next slide, in order to create system goals, we began by asking ourselves some essential guiding questions based on what is most important to us as a system serving K-12 students. Um, first, are all students growing academically, social, and emotionally every year? Are all students achieving high academic standards? And are all students empowered by having voice, choice, and ownership in their learning experiences? So it's out of these guiding questions that the Grow, Achieve, and Power was born, um, which really encapsulates for us those kind of three essential pieces of, of student outcome. And this is really um, what is central to all of our work and the measure by which we determine success. And all three are equally important in the life of a student because you can do one without the other. A student can be safe and nurtured emotionally but not achieving because there's inadequate rigor. A student can be achieving but in a classroom where the only focus is on uh, achieving certain benchmarks on tests without really instilling a love of learning and intellectual curiosity about the world. And a student can be empowered with voice and choice in certain aspects of learning, but be far behind peers because of a lack of attention to their unique learning needs. So all three are really fundamental for what we're doing and what we seek to accomplish as a system. Um, so the first, as we turn to the first priority, which is student growth, um, our guiding question led us to the creation of a commitment statement. Uh, Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools is committed to ensuring that all students grow academically, socially, and emotionally so they develop the knowledge, skills, and character necessary to excel in higher education, work, and life. So we, before we move to the associated goals, I just want to draw your attention to a few key words that highlight core beliefs that have come up in our strategic planning process. Um, the first one is all. We're really focused on all students, 100% of students, no matter where they start. Um, we are focused not just on academics, but social and emotional growth, which is significant, and you'll hear more about the measures that we're putting in place for that. Um, knowledge, skills, and character, because while we are preparing students for college and career, which is essential, we're also preparing them for success in life, which really combines a combination of these things, which are highlighted in our strategic plan goals. So now I'm going to turn it over to Paul Changus and Tamara Fentress, who are going to walk you through the specific goals associated with these student outcomes. Thank you, Lisa. The, uh, the data that we're going to start with is, uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide, is the achievement level data. This is across TCAP and end of course exams uh, across three subjects. Re well, our reading language arts, our math, and our science. And at the high school level, that's our English 2, our Algebra 1, and our Biology 1. We will be expanding those high school measures as we have new end of course tests that are now coming online with our accountability system. When we uh, when I talked to you earlier this year about our academic performance framework, we talked about the concept of looking at growth, not just moving kids into the, in our students into the proficient or advanced level, but moving them up into, uh, from below basic to basic, from proficient to advanced, that, that continuous scale. So what we have on this slide are the past three years of data since we moved to the new academic standards uh, in Tennessee in 2009-10 school year. And you can see at the top the percent advanced has increased uh, a little bit each of the last two years from 7.5% to a little over 10.5% over the last two years. And on the other end of the scale, the percent of students across all of these tests who scored below basic has dropped about eight percentage points from 30 to 22. We also have a greater number that are, that are showing proficiency. The arrows that are shown here are the increases that are seen at each level. So in 2000, from 2010 to 2011, we saw 1.2 percent 
this percentage point increase in the advanced students, a 4.1 percent increase from below basic to proficient, I'm sorry, from basic uh, to proficient, and then a 4.2 percent from below basic to basic. Last year, so in total that's about a nine percentage point increase. The following year, we also saw about a nine percentage point increase with, with similar data, uh, with a little more of an increase on the uh, top level, the advanced level. But what we want to do is to track our progress at the district level as we are with our schools to look at growth across all of these achievement levels. So that's where we've been over the last few years. And then uh, the next slide is showing our targets going forward. And let me start by saying uh, all of all the outcomes we're talking about today, uh, as Lisa mentioned, are student outcomes. We want the focus to be on how we're doing in terms of raising student performance, and typically it will be shown in terms of percentages of students. All of the uh, the data here is conditional because we don't have the 2012-13 data yet, and that will be our baseline. So uh, there's an asterisk there indicating that this is, a com again, a com combined result from TCAP and end of course exams over three subjects. But also, uh, we've got a pl we'll be using 2012 data typically as our placeholders going forward. So we will adjust when the new data comes in. The red bars indicate that we are looking at increasing uh, the percentage of students moving up to the next achievement level by 12 percentage points a year. But we're showing this as a cumulative effect because what we don't want is for students to, to move up one level and then the next year move down a level. We want to build on the growth we've seen from year to year. So over a five-year period, our goal is to raise the achievement level of 60% of our students uh, by, by, an, by a level on these tests, which means, again, from below basic to basic, basic to proficient, or proficient to advanced. Now, these are very ambitious targets. The, the, the solid line you see in black is showing the equivalent from the state accountability system that would be expected to hit our targets year after year. Uh, the state targets are based on uh, the goal of cutting the percent of students who are below proficient in half over an eight-year period. But it's, it's actually over an eight-year period, it, it turns out to be slightly less than half because they recompute that number each year and it, and it decreases it slightly. We're shooting for decreasing the number of students below proficient in half over a five-year period rather than an eight-year period, and we're not readjusting, so we're, we're keeping a constant target from year to year. So those are our goals and so what we're talking about is within one year of this year's baseline we'll see a 12 percentage point increase and we'll build on that again each year. The next slide is another way of measuring growth and this is using value-added data but it's using it in a way that we typically have it. Value added is typically reported at the teacher, the school, and the district level as an average score in terms of mean normal curve equivalent growth, which uh, is, is uh, not the most transparent measure for most people. What we're looking at here is what percentage of students meet or exceed their peers statewide in terms of growth from year to year. In other words, their ranking stays the same or increases from one year to the next. The statewide average would be 50 percent because this number is recomputed annually by the state that half the students would, would meet or exceed that number. And we were slightly below that in 2012. But what we're looking at is not just keeping up with the state but increasing by two percentage points a year uh, beginning this coming school year. And again, this would be across all of those TCAP and end of course exams. So Paul has just shared the academic um, growth goals with you, and now I'm going to move into the ones regarding social and emotional learning. Um, Lisa touched on the, the focus on social and emotional growth in our commitment statement for growth. So MMPS students will demonstrate annual growth in core social and emotional competencies as well as connectedness to school. Um, we actually pulled out two core components that we're going to cue in on, and those are student SEL awareness and competency, as well as student connectedness to school. 
Um, explicit teaching of social and emotional skills has been shown in hundreds of studies to be key to student success in school and life. So it is our responsibility as a school system to basically ensure all MMPS employees from principal, teacher, counselor, nutrition staff, bus driver, secretary, bookkeeper, central office leader, school board, that we commit ourselves to nurturing students' interpersonal as well as their interpersonal growth and to assisting the wider community to do the same. So solid evidence also exists that demonstrates classroom and school interventions that make the learning environment safer, more caring, better managed, and more particip participatory have been shown to increase student engagement and attachment to school. So in turn, students who feel more connected to school actually have better attendance, higher grades, and standard te standardized test scores, and higher graduation rates. They are also less likely to use alcohol and illegal drugs, experience less emotional distress, are less likely to engage in violent or deviant behavior, and are less likely to become pregnant. Um, it's basically that important, and that's the reason why we pulled the social and emotional piece out in our strategic plan. So while we are treading new ground of measuring SEL growth at the system level, our partnership with CASEL um, has and will continue to provide invaluable guidance in developing and continuously improving programs, evaluation, and monitoring. Um, so basically, just to give you some opportunities that we're, that we're currently identified for measuring SEL, um, we have an AIR, American Institutes of Research Survey, that was recently administered to 7th and, and 10th graders to measure SEL awareness and competency. Um, we also have where Castle. Um, the partnership with them where they've recently hired a staff to specifically focus in on metrics for SEL awareness. Um, we have the student perception survey and this is through the safe and supportive schools um, grant with the state and this has been piloted um, with middle school students as well as at the high school level um, surveyed on school climate elements that support SEL. And then also locally, we have um, more nation with um, Vanderbilt, and he's a well-respected expert on SEL-related intervention and research. Um, and basically, his group is working to construct a survey of teachers that corresponds to that S3, that Safe and Supportive School Survey, that will replace the TAIL survey. And Dr. Nation is offering MMPS technical assistance through the S3 grant so we can have input into this survey as well. So those are just some examples. Um, of, of actual measurements that we're, we're going to use as far as measuring SEL. Um, there's also one thing I just wanted to bring up was a Vanderbilt uh, capstone project. It identified some key reasons as far as why parents um, leave the district, the school district, and parents they frequently reported in the interviews that the sense that their child is known, cared for, and other things is a very important factor in parents deciding to stay in particular schools. Um, and so basically there are plans to work with the project lead and CASEL to develop observational rubrics as well to gauge alignment of how a student's self-reported SEL competency, how well they're doing in regards with observations as well. So it's not just one piece that we're going to look at as far as surveys, it's also the observations that we're going to um, use as far as measuring SEL. Um, the observational tool um, will likely have a common core focus since it is impossible to really implement common core without SEL. Currently we are working on embedding SEL goals into the curriculum which basically makes that a, a natural fit as well. And some of the current work that's actually upcoming this summer that I just wanted to note as well is the Social and Emotional Learning Conference, which is going to be held in July in collaboration with Alignment Nashville. So that's just to let you know that we are already moving in regards to SEL. And then there's the focus with Community Achieves, um, where all of their four focus areas touch on SEL from the college and career readiness, the family engagement, health and wellness, as well as social services. Okay, so those uh, touched on our um, focus on uh, student growth, academic, social, emotional. The next area is achievement, which as we all know is very important, and this is focused on all students achieving. So our guiding question here um, led us to create a commitment statement that states that Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools is committed to ensuring that all students meet or exceed academic targets so they are provided with increased opportunities to achieve success. And I'll pass this on to Paul who will walk you through some of our specific goals. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a rather common measure that's used uh, in terms of state accountability, looking at the percent of students who are proficient in advance. That's the percent meeting a high standard. Uh, unlike the state assessment, we're we're using uh, science as well, and again at the high school level, that's biology one and in our target setting, but. Uh, over the last three years, we've seen an increase across all of these uh, subjects and grade levels uh, from 34.8% of students reaching proficiency on those new, new uh, standards to 41.7% last year. Uh, again, this is high level uh, across multiple grades. What we will be doing is, Lisa mentioned earlier, uh, making the data available by subject, by grade level, by subgroup, by school. All of this information will eventually be in our data warehouse. This is t kind of big picture where we are as a district, but we want schools to be able to track their own performance in, in ways that are meaningful for school improvement planning. Now that's where we've been over the last few years. The next slide moves us into our targets going forward. Uh, and again, we have a solid line representing what the state accountability goal would be uh, during that time, uh, which is again over an eight-year period cutting the percent below proficient in half. We have again <laughs> taken a five-year plan, which uh, is quite ambitious, going from last year uh, just under 42 percent, and that baseline will be adjusted when the new date is here, to over 70 percent by 2017-18. Uh, uh, so that's where we are in terms of our state accountability measures uh, and where we plan to go. The next slide is looking at one piece of college and career readiness, and that's using ACT data. But this slide is a little different from what we typically see. Uh, ACT, as you know, is given as a college entrance exam at the high school level, typically among our juniors and seniors. We now have data available electronically from the state uh, based on projections from all of the state mandated assessments that have been given thus far. So for a third and fourth grader, it would be based on their TCAP scores across subjects. Uh, when we get into middle school and, and add the Explore assessment, which is one of the ACT planning assessments in the eighth grade, that information would be rolled in. When students start to take end of course exams, that data is used to project. Uh, students are projected well in advance going from, like I said, from third or fourth grade scores all the way to where they would be at the, at the current pace uh, by the time they leave high school. Our measure is the percent of students scoring a 21 or higher on the ACT. The 21 is the requirement for a HOPE scholarship and is generally seen as, as a good measure of college readiness. Uh, Currently statewide, about a third of our students in Tennessee are hitting that, that measure uh, on the 21. Uh, we, as we mentioned when we rolled out the academic performance framework, we were uh, concerned when we saw that currently our projections are only showing about 15% of our elementary and middle school students on track for a 21. That, that again is a, is a high bar, it's about the 67th percentile in Tennessee. And we have a lot of students in that 50 to 67 percentile range right below that. But we want to see these numbers increase significantly. And, and we're talking about five percentage point uh, increases per year in terms of targets, which is, uh, again, real uh, ambitious and more than we've typically seen with, with regard to our actual ACT data, which has gone up about a percentage point a year. But again, these are projections based on past history. What we have to do, and this is where students would be in 2017-18 uh, at the end of eighth grade. They still would have four years from that point on to, to show growth on, to the actual ACT exam. The next slide is actual ACT results. And we're, last year in 2012, we were at 29% of our high schoolers, uh, our seniors, scoring a 21 or higher. And uh, our goal is within five years to get that to uh, half of our students, 50%. And uh, so that, that leaves us with about a four to five percentage point increase per year. So that's one of our measures, and again, setting a high bar for college readiness. So 
So Paul just shared the ACT projections as well as the attainment of ACT scores. And so now I'm going to actually share two more um, college and career ready goals that we're looking at. So right now we have, um, by 2018, a certain percentage of MMPS high school students will be enrolled in courses for college credit. Um, also a percentage of those students enrolled, enrolled will take associate exams as well as pass the exam. So this, this measure actually hits on the three pieces in regards to the college and career, college credit courses. The second one is the, by 2018, 100% of MMPS high school students will complete a capstone experience. So basically the first goal accounts for enrollment, taking associate exam, and passage rate. The rigor of the courses for college credit alone better prepares students. Research published at the end of 2012 focused on examining the influence of dual enrollment on college degree attainment and whether these influence equally benefit all students or only so high socioeconomic status students. And what was found in that research is that dual enrollment positively influences college degree attainment, even after accounting for student, family, schooling achievements, and school context factors. Um, another thing it found was that the proportion of first generation students who attained any post-secondary degree is 8% higher if they participate in dual enrollment. Um, another one was that some evidence even suggested that first generation students were more likely to benefit from dual enrollment participation than those students with a college educated parent. And then another um, one last one is the gains were even larger for students taking two courses with little added benefit beyond six credits. And then for the second, the capstone experience, all MMPS high school seniors will basically participate in a capstone experience. And what this is, it's a project that allows students to learn about themselves by moving an idea or dream toward a topic of interest, specialization, community need, or career choice. And basically, this links right back with what the Tennessee graduation requirements um, require of MMPS. Uh, we have specific courses that count as capstone, and there are basically four types of courses, and that includes service learning, leadership three, capstone, um, which is available in IB and AP as well, and there's a list of CTE courses that count as capstone. Uh, the capstone experience consists of four P's, and those are paper, product, portfolio, and presentation. And currently, a capstone manual is being, will be formally published by July 1st, and it's going to be piloted next school year with plans to go to scale in 2014-15. Um, and the manual basically goes into more depth and explain, explains the components of the process in detail. Okay, so that encapsulates our, our goals around um, achievement, growth and achievement. And um, the final area for, of student outcomes um, that is an anchor in our strategic plan and our efforts for the next five years um, has to do with empowering students. Um, our guiding question really led us to a, a commitment statement. Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools is committed to ensuring that all students acquire the essential abilities, attitudes, and resources to improve their own future. And really, what this is about is about engagement, inspiration, and motivation. So like I mentioned before, that love of learning and the quest for knowledge. I am sure that probably everyone in this room could tell a story of a teacher who influenced their life um, and really often even changes the trajectory of our students' lives. And that's really what we want for all students. Um, this is what, for instance, the small learning communities in high school was all about. That's just one example of how we have been putting this into practice in myriad ways and will continue to do so because just as important as any test score is each student's really their belief in themselves, in their own efficacy, um, and our job is to increase their opportunities, uh, to increase the opportunities for them to practice owning their own learning. Um, so how this will be translated, we'll move on um, here, into goals is still uh, a work in, in process. So this really is the, 
the least developed part of the plan thus far, but not certainly not due to its lack of importance, but because um, this is really innovative, and our district is highlighting this as a system level goal and measure, and this is this is new ground that we're breaking here. Um, so we have some more work to do to really flesh out some goals because what we want is something concrete enough that we can measure, but also comprehensive enough to give us the kind of data, um, the kind of rich data we need to really see how we're doing from the perspective of our students. So again, this is, this is a shift here where the students are taking more ownership um, at, at the classroom level in their own learning. So, so far, we've really centered on these conceptual goals as priorities, though these are gonna be refined over the next month um, into some more concrete measures. And really the, the first one is just about students, teachers, and parents having conversations around student data and supporting student learning. Um, with the shift being the student being an essential participant in those conversations and really understanding their own data so that they can track their progress. The second is really having to do with students' perceptions of their learning experiences. So this is similar to SEL but this is really about asking students if they're challenged and how, um, really getting into their, their perceptions of their own learning day to day. Um, the third is uh, we, are, we are crafting a kind of formalized demonstration of student leadership competencies. And again, this would be to um, illustrate how students are, are owning their own learning and engaging in mean, meaningful ways in their school experiences. So this may be, for instance, how they might demonstrate mastery of a concept um, related to a, a project-based learning experience would be one example. Um, but we wanna make sure that whatever goal we align here really has the flexibility in it that honors differences in age, ability, and interests um, in learning styles. And the fourth one um, is centered around school choice and really exercising school choice based on the needs of individual students. So you know, we believe that students and families are empowered when they have uh, choices to meet students' unique strengths, needs, and interests. Um, so there's more to come there and that will be in further development, but that is the conclusion of our strategic plans system level goals. So now I think we can um, open it up to questions if you all have any. I'm going to give that to you. Dr. Brennan? <laughs> Ms. Barron? Uh, yeah, I've got several things I'm thinking about. Um, one is uh, we, we plan to cut our students uh, by 50% that are below basic. Do we? Bel below, profi right? below proficient, yeah. Okay. Uh, below Which would be proficient. below basic and basic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do we have a plan on how to do that? Well, that, get, well, that certainly gets into the strategies, many of which it, it have already started with, with MNPS Achieves and that process, but that's, that's kind of the next part we're going to roll out with regard to this. To, today we were focusing on the goals, but, but certainly the strategies are critical. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, thank you. And then the second thing I was thinking about is uh, I'm really glad to see, I mean, we've got a lot of focus on academics, which is important, uh, but sometimes I worry that we get too focused on academics, and as a result of that, other things suffer. Uh, so I'm glad that we're bringing in the social and emotional growth, and I really like the idea of empowering students to take responsibility for their own learning, and as they become motivated to learn, and I mean, that's 90% of it, when they are motivated and have the ability to seek out information in the areas that are interesting to them, then it just snowballs and they learn so much so quickly. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear how, how that progresses when you talk about strategies. Thank you. Ms. Kim? Um, sure, so uh, first of all, this is thrilling that we're aiming much bigger. Um, I mean, I think that pops through these pages. Um, I have a couple questions around, similar to Ms. Veering around um, our theory of change about, like, like, just off the top of your head, what are the three levers that we think we need to pull hardest in order to get to this? Um, so I, I anticipate part B <laughs> when it comes. Um, then one other thought is, so, so 
you know, right, I'm thrilled because we're actually aiming much higher. We're trying to beat sort of past performance um, pretty explicitly. And um, so that's great. At the, one of the challenges that I see with this is that, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on the system, as it should, I think in good ways, um, to force us out of our boxes and to innovate. You know, all this stuff ultimately is a lagging indicator, like every single one of these numbers, meaning once it, we know the result, there's too late to change it. That, so, yeah, so I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but it's just, it's just literally a lagging indicator. So I had lots of questions, not that I have to answer them now, but around like what are the leading indicators? Like how would we know we are on track or not on track and how do we use that to manage the system ongoing? Because, you know, most of this data doesn't show up until the very end and it's so high stakes, you know, once we put a stake in the ground about how big we're going. It's just something to think about. It's the difference between lagging and leading. And, and I'll just say, and, and that, that could be a discussion for another time in, in great depth, but uh, it's critical that we have measures in place. We're talking about the kinds of formative assessment pieces and benchmark data that we would collect. Uh, obviously, uh, schools have to uh, be able to anticipate performance by, and you know, and, and there, you know, there are things that we look at in terms of attendance and grades and formative data currently, but. Uh, all of this will have to be aligned and correlated with those critical measures at the end of the year, which again are lagging. That uh, there's going to be quite a bit of work that goes into that. We're also in a situation where the ass the assessments themselves and the curriculum is changing, and uh, one of the one of the key areas for us in this coming year is going to. to to look at that transition and see what we need to do in terms of having the right measures in place, but uh, we're we're well well aware that that's a challenge we have to uh, address quickly. And then within that, the reason I was asking, well, there's just the broader point, but then also um, these kinds of numbers suggest that we would have to be far more nimbler um, than we have been in the past, which is why, mm -hmm. like. Like working out, the, like so. If you work out from end to end, like okay, let's say in a hypothetical situation that a school you see a leaning indicator, whatever DEA use whatever, um, and they're not on track, like what is actually going to change? Because you would have to manage that so aggressively in order to hit these goals, which again, I love um, in terms of what we're aiming for. But I just think it'd be a radical like mindset shift for everybody in the system. Um, the operators on the ground, the people at the district, it just seems inevitable, just given how big we're aiming. Um, and then the, sorry, I had, oh, on slide 14, the, I mean, I like the direction you're, you're going in terms of dual enrollment and AP courses and whatnot, um, particularly given some of the data I looked at from 20, it must have been 2011, not 2012, on, number of people who are taking AP courses and MMPS, how many of them passed the courses, um, passed the test, et cetera. Um, so I, I like that direction. The last one, I mean, this is my two cents, but I mean, this, like, assuming that these, both of these measures, the so bullet one, bullet two, are essentially proxies um, for college and career readiness, um, the last one strikes me, it strikes me as, like, potentially processy. I mean, there's so many numbers everywhere. Like, I think it's going to be hard even to just, like, get our heads around everything else before. So if, if we wanted to have to stop doing any of this, I would propose that that be one of them. Um, not that I'm against capstone experiences, by the way. I think it's a great idea. But in terms of measuring, like, I'd be mu I'm much more naturally like, excited about the top one rather than the capstone. Um, so Jay, Jay, you uh, it's, it's a requirement. Um, oh, well, sorry. in that case, we don't need to argue. If the Fed started requiring it, then sorry, end of story. Well, the, the capstone experience is in, in three components. Um, every student will be required to do a, a work-based experience, so an internship or a service learning project or a research project, depending on their pathway and their, um, uh, their diploma pathway in high school. Um, so for those kids going into, like, let's say the, the financial academies, they're going to do uh, a work-based internship at one of the credit unions or banks. A lot of our kids, middle school kids, will be required to do a service learning project starting next year. Um, and then a lot of the kids in the um, international baccalaureate, advanced placement courses, or in some of our STEM programs are all doing research projects. So it's teaching those kids the, the, those skills um, that colleges are going to require. It's giving them the work experience or the community experience. So every student will be required to do it. That's what we're calling a capstone. It actually is a course that is the culmination of K through 12, all of their learning experiences into um, 
um, an actual course that is outlined with a research paper, an online portfolio uh, that demonstrates the competencies that, that they have that those students can take with them after they leave high school. Got it. And this is a federal requirement? Like what it, it is a state it's requirement. State requirement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And never mind. Keep that. <laughs> um, let's see. And then, uh, well, actually, we can move on. I'm not gonna. You don't. You, we're not going to hold you to certain questions. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back at the end. Ms. Shepard. Okay. Okay. Right. Mr. Pinkston. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I concur. I mean, I was excited to see us aiming high and higher um, than, than where we've been. I've got a couple of questions to start with, and we look at slide six. Um, so you guys know that I'm obsessed with what I call the headlines. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding the headline correctly on this slide is over five years, this is the growth, um, uh, the growth goal slide, uh, advancing at least one achievement level. Um, over five years, our goal is to significantly and consistently exceed, exceed the state growth goals. Is that it's basically yes. Yes, right? Yes. Um, and then kind of Fast forward to slide 10. Um, I think Elisa a second ago uh, was asking about um, kind of high leverage opportunities. Um, if, if we're looking at that 2011-2012 uh, 41.7% uh, uh, proficient or advanced on state assessments number. That's a composite of various subjects. So, like, can you just aggregate that verbally a little bit? I mean, I don't need like precise numbers, but but you know, where is the highest leverage point inside? that composite that we could pursue to really, uh, if we said, you know, we're going to really double down on something, what would it be? Would that be like high school math or, or excuse me, most school math or something? Okay. Well, uh, and, and I do have it broken down uh, by by subject uh, and, and through the tiers, but and, and eventually we can break it down by grade level. But uh, right now our math scores are a little bit below at K-8. Uh, below our reading and, and our science is actually a, a little bit higher. We're at about 38% in 2012 proficient and advanced in math, 40% reading, 44% science. Math statewide in K-8 uh, has been the, the biggest challenge and, it, and it, more than any other subject it gets harder from, from one grade to the next to maintain proficiency. Uh, at the high school level, uh, our biology scores uh, are currently the lowest of the, of the uh, three that we're using here. They were about 37 percent. Our highest were in English 2. Uh, we will be adding Algebra 2 and English 3. Those are, those are coming online uh, in the state accountability system, and, and there will be uh, opportunity for growth there. Algebra 2 in particular is, is, a, is a tough test. but. Uh, when you break it down by grade, it, it's kind of hard to compare some of the grade level data because the state standard does get get harder, but in, in the upper middle school grades, mathematics is still probably our biggest challenge. Okay. Um, and just kind of dwelling on that slide, or reflecting on it for a minute, looking at um, going from the first year, 2009 to 2010, forward each year, that was a uh, 2.7 point gain. Um, from 09, 10 to 10, 11, 4.2 from 10, 11 to, to 11, 12, and then flipping to, to slide 11, um, okay, we're basically kind of talking about doubling, right, our year over year growth. That, I mean, again, I'm just kind of trying to just reframe this in my own mind, and, and is that, I'm reading that correctly, right? Yeah, you're, you're reading that correct. Okay. Yeah, it, it's not quite doubling, but it's close, is, is our goal. And uh, it, like I said, these are very ambitious, and, and we do, uh, and even, you know, even if hitting the state target is, is a pretty ambitious goal to do it year after year across all subjects, but we also know that we have more students who are below proficient, and we have to push that pace. I've got other questions on the ACT stuff, but I'll come back to that. Ms. Brown. Um, I have several thoughts, um, and I agree with what you said. I think it's great that we're setting clear goals and we have clear measures, and um, I love the focus on social and emotional learning. Um, I guess I'll start out first. I, I, it, I just went to a TSBA training, Ten School Board Association training, uh, and I just want to start with a comment on ACT. I'm going to head to that. 
Um, and we as a group are sort of looking at trends nationally, which is kind of interesting to me. It's a different way of looking at where we are on the ACT. Um, and so I beg pardon if this is incorrect, this is what we as a group at our training came up with on the statistics by looking at ACT.org. Um, but the national composite on ACT is 21.1 uh, last year. And then of the nine states that test all students for the ACT, which is a very limited number, um, the, uh, the composite was 20.9. The composite for Tennessee was 19.2. And then the, comp uh, the composite for our county was 18.4. So clearly we're not where we need to be, um, but I honestly, I found this sort of um, encouraging data because it shows that as we are trending upwards on the ACT test scores, um, we are getting close to the, where Tennessee is, and obviously we want every, every child to be at a 21, um, but I think given the fact that we are a large urban district which has um, unique challenges uh, and, uh, and difficult populations to serve, I really I found that to be sort of encouraging data. Um, and I think I'm really interested to see where we end up with ACTs this year because I think that's going to be very informative. Um, and then a, a couple of questions. I was wondering, um, as we're in this presentation, if we will be able to do or we consider doing um, targeted inter interventions at schools that are um, having difficulty meeting goals. And so I was thinking about things like uh, longer school hours or summer programs or those sorts of things. <coughs> Has anyone discussed that as a possibility? Yeah. Jay, Jay, would you speak to that, please? Yes, actually we have been discussing that and we're developing intervention plans now uh, in leadership and learning. We're working with federal programs, Dr. McCarger and Mary, oh, they're both right here. Um, we are um, trying to design some rubrics that will measure the effectiveness of programs, whether it's personnel like instructional coaches or whether it is actually a software or an intervention that's been put into place to see how effective they are and then make decisions based on that. We're also in the process of training a group of people starting tomorrow on external reviews through using the tribal process. Um, and that process will be owned by leadership and learning and the people that are trained to be external reviews to go into those targeted schools to assess what's happening and help that school's leadership team develop an intervention plan that will address specifically what those shortcomings are. Right, so we are working on that. And then one final question that Thomas went on. Uh, the issue of service learning has come up for me recently. Uh, I think is the right term. It basically means just sort of volunteering in the community and, and uh, build, helping build your resume that way, but also helping out the community. And um, I understand that we're sort of in the process of building that into our curriculum, I guess. I don't know. I, but, but with its capstone experience, yes. I just sort of brought that to mind. Yes, that is true. We have developed guidelines of what service learning um, the, the whole capstone experience should look like. That's being piloted in every single school, even Fog MLK, this fall. And um, the goal is within two years to go 100% uh, of all students. And then the whole service learning piece is going to be one of the non-negotiables for middle schools also. So they'll start the experience there, but the 12th grade will be the culminating experience that follows the prescribed guideline. What will they be required to do? A certain number of hours volunteering? Or um, I, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. There is okay. a committee through the Alignment High School Committee that's developed that whole outline. Okay. We're actually going on a retreat this Friday and Saturday in Chattanooga to go through everything in detail and, and make the final approval. Um, and then that will be rolled out this summer to the principals. Um, okay, before we go to second rounds, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, I agree with the uh, other board members. This, this is a pretty lofty goals we've got here. Impressive. Now, um, my question is, I keep going back to the one word uh, that is included in every one of these uh, goals, and that is all students, or the two words, all students. And when I think about all of our students, um, I go outside of the normal realm of thinking when I'm considering um, EL students, life skills, exceptional ed, general ed, AL, ALS students, academy students, are we really including all of our students in this? Uh, and the reason I ask that is because a lot of these measures seem to begin at fourth grade, but what are we doing to capture our students prior to that? They walk into our classrooms sometimes in pre-K or kindergarten. It's not too late or too early to get these students started because in my, in my mind, um, the sooner you get them started on learning, the more effective it will be down the road. 
Um, and I started looking through this, and um, I will use an example um, that, that I've had. Um, it, my family's been in childcare for as long as I can remember. I think it may have started back in the rock ages or something, I'm not sure. But one thing that I've learned about childcare is that you have less of an attrition rate when you um, are more in tune with what's going on with not just the child, but the child's family. Um, just as you're talking about here, SCL awareness is fantastic because um, it decreases the behavior um, issues with a child. It increases the parental involvement with the child, and it shows that the child and the parents that you care. That, in turn, increases academic performance. And I've seen that happen at child care level. Um, that could also go into um, our schools. Um, and I've seen it. I've seen how that continuous support continues to uh, send children on an academic growth. So my question is about around growth. I notice here that everything that I'm seeing here, you've got your goals here, but I don't see anything regarding parental involvement. Have you addressed that? Is that something that you're considering? Because um, when I look at this, percent of MMPS students rating their social, social emotional health find the following five areas, self-awareness, self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Decision but how do we incorporate this into, um, let me just put it this way. I had a comment the other day from a, a parent who said, you know, my biggest issue right now is that I have so many friends who are parents of children in MNPS that are not involved. And so how can we expect more from our children if we don't give more to our children? Um, MNPS cannot be expected to do it alone. And that's what my point is here. We are, we are really ramping this strategic plan up uh, to a very high level, to a fantastic level. But we don't need to, we, don't, we always need to consider what our parents' involvement is. We have a lot of parents who want to be involved, um, who can be helpful resources for us in getting our children academically, um, their academic performance a lot higher. So I think it's going to be imperative that we include them in some sort of manner here um, in how we grow our academic performance in our children. Um, that really wasn't a question, though, was it? Um, but uh, this is a good statement, though. And, uh, uh, Tony's been very involved in developing the uh, family and community engagement in this process, and it's really embedded across the board. Uh, so Lisa and maybe Tony, you, each of you might want to address address the issue. Yeah, just from the standpoint of the strategic plan, I mean, one difficulty in presenting this to you today is we're just presenting a piece of it, the goals, um, but parent engagement and parent involvement is very much a part of, of the strategies of the plan, as well as, um, like Dr. Register said, that for instance, the student services strategic action plan. Um, so it is, it is front and center in this, and even in some of our high-level system strategies, in terms of how to um, get to these goals that we think parents are essential, MMPS can't do it alone, community support is essential, and, and really strong partnerships with community entities is essential. So that's all a part of our, um, our strategies in terms of how we're going to actually accomplish this. That's, that's woven in there. I don't know. And I'm going to beat a dead horse, but shouldn't it be included in the goals if it's part of your strategy? Yeah, and I think that's something that, um, that Tony can address. Uh, th these, again, were... Um, kind of system level goals, it does not mean that there won't be specific goals and performance measures for initiatives that would actually <coughs> engage parents, and I'll let Tony speak to that. Yeah, when you look at the language that's being used, it's not listed specifically, but it's relatively implied when we talk about learners and the overall systems approach. So when we talk about empowerment and things of that nature, we're not just talking about students. We are talking about empowering student, or parents. We're also talking about empowering the community. The Community Achieves Initiative is one uh, process that's going to allow us to do this, because one of our focus areas is, of course, parental engagement. But it also has a substantial community engagement component as well, focusing, focusing on health and wellness, social services, and college and career readiness. At the same time, you have the support services side of the equation, which has our family involvement and our cluster support teams, who work exclusively with working with parents and community organizations to become more advocates within the school, but also advocates within the community as well. Because all of our parents cannot be involved in a physical sense in the building, but they can be uh, engaged in the educational process and supporting the education of their child. Okay. 
And that's the one thing that I would encourage you to sort of figure out a way to trickle that down because a lot of times it doesn't get sent to the parents. It's at the school level, but the engagement of the, the required or desired engagement of parents doesn't leave that school uh, on a lot of uh, occasions, and that's unfortunate. Um, another question that I have, and I will get into ACT, because, and I know that we are not looking at complete data here, um, but on slide number 12, we have the, um, by 2018, we want to see a 40% 40 um, 40 of elementary and middle school students projected to uh, 21 or higher on the ACT. Um, now, Dr. Chengis, you said, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the target is 5% a 5 increase per year, year over year, as far as the increase goes, is? Yes. So we're giving our, ch our elementary and middle schools five years to get to 40 percent. Is where are we right now? Maybe I'm, I'm missing something. Where are we right now? Is this the 15, 15 percent? Slightly above 15 percent is okay. our in 2012. We don't obviously okay, but have, we don't have data the data yet. Okay. So I guess maybe I just need an explanation of why we're not being more aggressive. Because if I look at this. Um, we want to get our elementary and middle school students to 40% by the time they're ready to enter high school. But then I flip to the next chart, and we want a 50% in, um, want to get our high school students to 50%. So am I reading this incorrectly? No, no, if I can address that. This would be 40% of students by the eighth grade year in five years being on track. Mm -hmm. but, but to break it down, we really need to look at cohort by cohort. We would want, there's, by eighth grade, they still have four years mm -hmm. until high school. What we have to do is to look at those students who, uh, you know, in the class of 2014 15 and, and where they are, you know, three years later uh, in terms of their performance and break it down by cohort. But if, if we can get 40% across three through eight, my hope would be that the highest percentages would be at the seventh and eighth grade level where we have less time uh, to, to change their trajectory than it would be at the third or fourth grade. This is the first time we've ever had this projections data and knowing how difficult it's going to be to move is still to be determined because it, it is a pretty high bar. But uh, while we feel this is pretty ambitious, we are aware that that's not the end of the story. We've still got four more years that we've got to, to move more students upward. Okay. Um, and, then, and one last question. Um, TCAP testing starts, what, fourth, third or fourth grade? Third grade. Third grade. Okay, so what are we doing to measure achievement between pre-K, K, and, and third grade? And, and I'll just say that there are several uh, assessments that are that are in place that uh, are more formative in nature. We did give the Stanford Achievement Test this year, uh, beginning uh, as a baseline data in kindergarten. I think that's something we're going to, to reassess and, and the value of that. Uh, the biggest concern, I think, and, and there's going to be a lot of data on students, and we're probably going to, to reassess uh, what's most informative to the classroom teacher. The concern would be trying to make this uh, an accountability measure and losing that formative value. So I, I think there needs to be some discussion around what can be used as a high level goal and, and keep the validity of that assessment. But uh, we know that you know, we know that we can't wait till the third grade to get information on students and we, we have other measures that are in place. And, and I, I like the uh, simple approach, stay in your lane. So I stay in my lane, that's why I ask the questions. I'm not trying to get uh, no, it's, deep it's into a very, it. It's a very good question, and it's one we're, we're grappling with right now. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I ask that, and I'll shut up and move on in, in just a second here, is because if we wait, the later we wait to, to understand uh, the academic achievement of our students, the more difficult it's going to be to get them where they need to be. So that's one of the reasons, that's the main reason I was asking about that. So um, I think you've answered my questions for now. We'll start back with Dr. Gentry. Um, so just kind of piggyback on Ms. Kim's question regarding um, a lot of what you have here really depends on being able to know. Uh, so do you think that the tools that we have now that we use as performance indicators 
So, you know, I, I really appreciate these guys tell you I try to stay out of the how. That's not my thing. I'm talking about like it's not about the how person, but with, with our role here as a board to make sure that we can align our policy and align our budgets and align where we can to support you. So my first question would be, do the assessment tools that we use today, do you think they're sufficient as uh, tools to give you those, give us those leading indicators that we need to make those adjustments along the way? Or is that going to be, because I'm really trying to get to, I agree this is great, sorry I didn't say it, but I need to repeat, how do we help you do and, and stay on track with this? Because you know, you've talked a lot about this being, not wanting this to be a punitive tool to our teachers. We don't want it to be a punitive tool to you. <laughs> so yeah. the goals are lofty. We've got to figure out now how do we get the right people, processes, and technology in place um, to support our ability to stay on track with this. So my first question is around the assessment. Well, I'll, I'll start, and there may be others, including our chiefs, who want to jump in. We have a lot of data on students. Whether all of the pieces are there, uh, probably not, but uh, I think we're well ahead of most school districts in terms of, particularly in terms of the data delivery and, and the data warehouse that we have. But the assessments are, can be challenging right now with the, the move to Common Core and the fact that we're still accountable for uh, the old standards. But there's still work to be done in terms of identifying the assessments that will drive instructional practice. Uh, the, the concern that I shared with Ms. Mays is that we don't, there are always unintended consequences when, when data surfaces at a high level that it becomes an accountability measure, a performance measure. We don't want we don't want to lose the value of the formative piece that will drive our day-to-day -day decisions. But uh, I think we're well positioned. There's still work to do, but we'll be looking at the relationship of the, the different measures we do have in terms of longitudinally, how does it correlate with other key measures uh, with, with those lagging indicators. Uh, but you know, there's still work to do, I'll say that, but I think we're, we're in pretty good position. So uh, another comment that was made about um, needing to be nimble, because right, so all things being equal, we've got the right tools, we get the leading indicators, and we need to make adjustments. I just want to, we've done a lot of state of the obvious today, but this isn't something new. This needing to, I mean, this is what we started with data, with the data warehouse, with creating data coaches. So this isn't anything new. But really the only thing that has changed significantly are the targets. And so I think our principals, our data coaches are already well trained and being able to take the data and make the adjustments. My question to you would be, are we going to be able to document interventions? So can I pull out sort of a roadmap that says if, if Sally is trucking along and then she gets, we, we have the leading indicator that says she's not gonna hit the target or be predicted to make the 21 of the ACT, what are some documented interventions um, which, in my mind, ties back to tools, ties back to resources, but documented interventions so that that reaction can be quicker and we don't have to call a meeting you know, the minds to figure out what to do, but we have something already, sort of a roadmap already planned out for if you see this, if the scores are in this range, this is what needs to be done, so on. And others can speak to the actual interventions, but I will say that our data warehouse has the capability and is being used to document all of those, all those attempts to reach that child and to change that uh, performance, whatever, if, whether it's behavioral, whether it's academic. Uh, and I know that our academy coaches are meeting uh, with, with teachers to, to look at, you know, what else can we try? And, and there's a lot of work going on around that. But uh, I don't know if Mr. Steele would like to speak to that. Well, let me, let me give you a, a list of things we're working on. Um, leadership and learning came together with instructional support back in February with the new reorg. And in the back of this room, we put up, I had them list every initiative that they were working on. It was overwhelming. I mean, it was well over 100. We narrowed that down to 15 priority 
projects that we're working on uh, for next year that tie into the strategic plan. Those are the action items that Lisa's been talking about. And they are developed in a smart format. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, this district does not have a reading or a literacy plan. I know Jill's on the committee, Linda DePriest is leading that committee to develop a K-12 continuum of what literacy and reading look like from grade level to grade level, starting with pre-K, aligning textbooks, aligning strategies, aligning best practices. A numeracy plan, um, Brenda Steele is leading that committee. Advanced academics plan, um, our exceptional ed plan, our English learners plan, our high school, middle school, elementary plan, our learning technology, um, and our professional development. Everything we're redesigning into a smart format over a three-year action plan. The embedded components are social emotional learning. Every plan must address how they affect EE students and EL students. They must have STEM embedded, but the biggest thing is the continuous improvement process, which is my dissertation that I have the research now that shows um, the actual results of the continuous improvement model, which is born out of total quality management, which was a business practice. It is eight steps that um, really prescribe for schools, and we've been using it with fidelity in the high schools this year around literacy that describe what you do you, when you disaggregate that data and you break it down into benchmarks, and then you the whole school focus focuses on that one benchmark and then they assess it with a, a very short four to five question formative assessment looking for 80% mastery. So after that skill is taught for three weeks, the school then comes back together and disaggregates the data to see what interventions need to be put into place immediately right there. You can change the schedule of the day, you can change teachers around to put kids with those high performing teachers who are getting the results, other kids go into enrichment. So uh, Glencliff is probably the best example of that done with fidelity and it's really paying off in uh, identifying those, those high yield strategies that really do have that immediate effect with students. I mean, it, it is what I'm also seeing in our charter schools when I go there. It is based on a skill, based on 80% mastery, and then reteaching and changing the configuration to, to target that student. So Brenda and I have talked, um, K-12 continuous improvement will be a non-negotiable next year focused on literacy to, to um, help develop that. Another thing are the network lead approach, um, creating these groups of schools that will come together as a cluster of schools around um, an issue. It could be schools that are struggling with literacy combined with schools that are performing well in literacy or numeracy. Um, the network coach concept that we're about to identify in the next uh, two weeks, 16 lead coaches for the district that will be those people that identify the best practices and are able to work with those schools and target those schools that need that intervention immediately. And then the external review process will allow us as we go in to diagnose what's happening within that school, pull out the best practices or diagnose what is not happening so we can align resources to that. So we think once, once the plans are in place, the issues have been identified will be a little more nimble and be able to react to it much faster instead of letting it be a lagging indicator. So we have plans to address it, but. One of my concerns that's, uh, that approaches your question, I think, but probably not specifically, uh, is the transition that we're getting ready to go through. Uh, this, uh, I think, that the, the work that Paul and his staff, Tina back there and others, in conjunction with uh, leadership and learning has been very thoughtful. And I think you can see from that the the charts are simple, but they uh, but they're but they're in front of or they try to tell a very complicated and complex story about developing our kids in the district. Uh, we've got to go. We've got to convert again our testing program to a park assessment for Common Core. And uh, Paul might want to address how he sees going through that transition. But the transition's not just testing. Uh, you know, a concern I've had this year is, do we have uh, do we have two masters? Do we have TCAP and standards that the states uh, already imposed and raised uh, in the last few years under, by essentially Governor Bredesen? And now we're going to Common Core, and are those aligned? And is and are teachers confused by that? I've I've been concerned about that this year because I think. There's not, uh, we don't know exactly which path we ought to take in that regard. And you can, you can speak to that if you will, Bob. Well, yeah, so certainly it, 
it is a challenge when when there is a somewhat of a misalignment between our curriculum and what we're being held accountable for in terms of state accountability, and that that's led to additional testing and and uh, time away from instruction. Uh, the, the transition to park. Uh, we know that these are going to be very rigorous assessments. We know that, that just the way they're delivered is going to be quite different. We know that that will impact the numbers we're seeing and any adjustments that we make will be with the intention of keeping these on much of an, as much of an equal scale as we can. We'll use uh, the data that comes from the value added assessment uh, system and, and relative ranking of our students to, to help in that. But, uh, it is a very different way of, of looking at uh, student achievement and we'll go into greater depth more in, in skills that we think are valuable and the problem solving and, and the application of skills but uh, it, it's, it, it's going to be a challenge just in terms of trying to maintain continuity in, in our measures over the next few years. So one of my last comments really kind of aligns with that Dr. Rush because my concern is that Talk about students, and then you know, Ms. Mays make excellent points. Make sure we don't forget the parents, but we've got the teachers um, as well that are kind of central yeah, to all of this in, in helping them understand, you know, what's available to them, what is really expected of them, what should they be responding and reacting to. And so, I mean, I know you can't answer. I don't even want you to attempt to answer it now. But I think one of the things that I would be looking for in the next update is how are we reengaging our our teachers to keep them motivated and inspired to, um, to, to, to help and support these goals. I think uh, the interesting comment um, from uh, regarding Glencliff is that it sounds like a, a, you know you have a school that feels, you have teachers within the school that feel responsible for all of the students and not just the students within their class. And we talk a little bit, not often enough, I think, about that cult, those culture changes that need to happen. So I think that's probably the biggest shift in order to stay on task with these goals is seeing that type of a culture change that you've seen at Glencliff manifest itself in our other schools within the district. The, the other piece, and I know you guys said you had not vetted uh, a lot on, around is the empowering the students. And so I, I will say that a lot of, a, a little bit of what was shared in, in the cursory um, you know, presentation that you were able to give tonight seem more like achievement and growth than empowering. So um, I do look forward to seeing your next pass at, at what empowering our students look like and you know, taking the lunch and I'll tell you my thoughts about it. Actually bringing our national, uh, Castle's bringing its national convening to Nashville uh, in the fall. Uh, and uh, we've been very heavily involved in that social emotional learning concept. The problem is there aren't many ways to measure that. Yeah. And, and we're, we're developing a really strong partnership with Castle and we'll be um, on the forefront of the development of those measures to really look, be able to quantify what we're doing in the area of social and emotional learning. Yeah, and I see this really more as almost taking responsibility. Uh, being a little bit more proactive and so you know not waiting until your senior <coughs> year and realizing you didn't take English 3. <laughs> that, that kind of thing and uh, you know and I've seen other environments where tools have been developed that really make the students it probably, probably works better with high school students but the things that I've seen but makes them responsible and accountable for ensuring they have the right conversations and the right meetings and fill out the right applications and take the right tests and have the right um, you know, uh, service learning experiences, all that stuff is just documented and prepackaged, and they're responsible as well. Not a guidance counselor responsible for 300 students, but one student responsible for themselves. Um, and so, you know, trying to create, develop a tool to create a bandwidth of accountability. Um, because, you know, as we've said a couple of times here, the schools cannot do it all of them on their own. The students and parents have to become partners uh, in that education experience. Dr. Brown? Ms. Barron, any additional comments? Ms. Kim? I do have one. Dr. Chang, as you mentioned, um, 
reassessing the Stanford testing for kindergartners. Have you gotten much feedback on that this year? Not, I not that I can yeah. share in mixed company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a challenge. Uh, and, and we're waiting, we're waiting to see the data to see uh, how much of a challenge. Uh, I think there's some students who can take a standardized test at that age, and there are others who can't. And uh, whether it whether the data matches what we see in other areas will be a concern. But regardless of the data, we may we, you know that that may not be the deciding factor. And uh, Dr. Register can speak to that probably better than I can. From my days as an elementary principal, there's some five-year-olds who don't have fine motor skills color in dots. You know, just think about it. That That's a very simplistic approach to it. But it's five years old, too young to give standardized testing. But there are other measures that should be used. And, I, and personally, I think that there are other measures that should be used other than standardized testing. I think if you involve the parents uh, early on in uh, social emotional learning, uh, make them more become more aware of the students that you you do have as they grow. Not necessarily standardized tests, but you just need to understand the students that are coming into your school so that you understand better how to teach them. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, giving a five-year-old standardized test, you are just poking around in trouble at that point. I think we have some really good stories. That I bet you. Share. <laughs> I bet you do. Although, do we know how many states use this different? I do not. How many states do the standard yeah. at, at that grade states. level? Or Yes, and what the results are? Uh, I, I don't have data on how many. I know that it is a nationally standardized test. Okay. We didn't anticipate giving it in kindergarten this year. The, the original plan was it was going to be a fall to spring assessment uh, starting in first grade. The state has now gone to a spring to spring test, and that was the kindergarten and now serves as the baseline for growth purposes. But. Uh, I, I, my guess is that it's probably a, a decision. I don't think there are many states that mandate it. Uh, I think it's probably up to individual districts. And typically, my experience has been that uh, those, dis, you know, that, that a relatively small percentage of districts across the country are probably using it, but I don't have the data for sure. Well, one thought is when we get the data back, given the controversy, because we have, I think it sounds like all of us have heard it, um, and various challenges, which makes sense. But then if I knew that, let's say, Boston was giving it, and they're performing at this level, and we're here, that doesn't make me want to, I mean, I just think that's an interesting question to talk about. So I would love to see the results. Like, well, we can certainly, we, we can certainly ask the vendor Pearson uh, for, to, you know, for that information. Yeah. Well, an, another interesting question to ask is what's the purpose of giving a SAT 10 in kindergarten? Yeah. Kindergarten does seem well, It's my understanding that the real, the real purpose for doing that is to be able to have an objective measure to evaluate teachers. And I don't think that's really what we're after at the kindergarten level. Sorry, we hijacked your question. Oh, Did no, you have a question? Mr. Pinkston. Yeah, I've just got one other question and then a uh, comment. Um, can we look at slide 13? Is that what we're looking at right now on the screen? Okay. Um, so, tra track backward for just a minute to, let's just say, 09, 010. So, the, the, the ACT data is, uh, that we're reflecting there is really 2011 12 data, which shows 29%. Um, of our high school kids scored 21 or higher on a, on the ACT, and 21 being the you know, the average nationally, correct? I'm sorry, 21, 21 being the average nationally, but again, that's most states only only a small percentage of states are giving it to all students. But yes, the 21 is the average. Uh, in 2009-10, we were at 27% uh, of our students uh, district-wide scoring 21. The following year, 2010-11, we were at 28%. So we've gone up one percentage point a year. And we know that this is a measure that reflects many years of education preparing students. So uh, that's why that the strategies and interventions that occur in earlier grades and getting those projections up in the earlier grades is critical to our success here. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was um, my comment. I know that ACT is the most stubborn indicator that there is um, and that 
you know, like the stock market, past performance is not an indicator of future success, but it seems like we're going to have to have some very highly intentional ACP strategies if we're really going to move that um, at the, the level that you guys have set. Um, so we look forward to hearing about that. Um, and the only other uh, comment that I had um, was uh, I just want to thank everybody for the really excellent thinking um, and thinking uh, about the future. Um, I have over the last couple of months talked at different times about bringing a motion to revise the academic achievement policy. I know that sounded like big talk, maybe there for a while, but, um, but I didn't want to bring anything into this room that wasn't properly grounded uh, in what was possible um, and what was ambitious. And, and tonight, these look you know, reasonably ambitious to me, these new goals, especially in the middle of implementing common core standards and bringing you know, assessments online in 2014 15. This is going to be really complex no matter what. So I just wanted to reiterate that I now we're working with Dr. Register and Dr. Changus and the rest of the team to bring a motion that's reflective of what we've talked about here tonight. Um, and I just would just say, let's just not lose sight of the fact that our ultimate goal needs to be 100%, uh, right? I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day what this is all about. But this is I mean, just doubling down on kind of where we're going is, is really a terrific start. So thank you guys very much. Ms. Brown? I'm going to wait my turn because I have feedback on the SAT 10. Because <laughs> I have a kindergartner, and I just want to say, this is maybe going out of my lane, but um, I watched this process this year, and, you know, we've got five-year-olds in there, and aside from the obvious question of whether they can color in the lines for the bubble, they can't read. I mean, a lot of them can't really read the test. And so I, I think, you know, I'm not an educator, and I don't know what the answers are, but I just really would like us to see what to look at more developmentally appropriate tests for that age level. Um, you know, I've been, I think, you know, I've been critical of the quantity of assessments that we have. I think a lot of people are complaining about that because it is affecting the school culture. It is affecting whole child education, the social emotional development. Um, and that's a negative. I do, I, I, we have to have some form of assessment, obviously. I just think that is a really complex question to figure out, you know, what, whether the assessments are needed and at what age and you know whether they're driving performance and whether they are you know they shouldn't be punitive they should be trying we should be focused on trying to push the students forward so um i watched the sat 10 this year and just my anecdotal story was i asked my son well how did you prepare for that and he said we practiced and he still be quiet <laughs> which sort of struck me as absurd so they spend about two hours bubbling in answers on the test, and I just think there are probably better ways to measure. I don't know what those are, but that's my two Any other comments? Well, I will say I thank you very much to you guys. This is some pretty interesting uh, information, and like Ms. Kim, I'm looking forward to that being. <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, I expected that first, the first part of the work session to last about 45 minutes and uh, I expected the second part to last about an hour or so. Chris, you have a real challenge. <laughs> yeah, because we're leaving at seven. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> so come on up, Chris. Uh, we, uh, uh, as, as all of you know, we're uh, and this is a this is a, a work in progress. Also, while Chris is getting set up and we're making transition here, I'll say a few introductory remarks. Uh, all of you know, and uh, that uh, Thursday evening at six o'clock, I uh, will be uh, going before Metro Council to uh, discuss the budget. Uh, and, and let me interject, board members. If you can be there, please be there. This is our budget that we are asking approval on, so it will be essential for us to be there. Sorry, go ahead. So, um, so the board has, uh, and I, this for, the, per, for the, the viewing audience, I think it's important to say this. The Board of Education has already adopted a proposal or budget. We've, we've made a recommendation. Uh, that recommendation is for a certain amount of money. The mayor has recommended now to Metro Council a different amount. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, at this point in time, it's premature to deal with specifics in the budget. You've already adopted a budget request, and, uh, uh, and Metro Council will question 
us about that proposal Thursday and set a final amount. At that point in time, after Metro Council approves the budget, we'll come back and this board will have uh, the responsibility of finally determining what the budget is. So uh, prior, to the, prior to the Metro Council hearing, it's premature to talk about real specifics in the budget, but we are here to talk about the, the ideas and the approach that we're taking. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Chris for an update. Thank you, and, and I will I do my best to be brief, and I think I can. Um, the first thing that I wanted to point out, uh, with, it's up on the screen and it also uh, was given to you as a handout, is uh, as far as funding sources and, and revenue. Uh, as you all know, our current year budget is 720.4 million. Uh, as Dr. Register indicated, the mayor's recommended increase is $26 million, which is a 3.6% increase. And that $26 million, as we discussed at the last uh, board meeting, is made up of basically three different sources, uh, the largest being the school district's fund balance. Uh, $12 million of the $26 million would come from our fund balance that's been accumulated over time, which would still leave uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a 6.5% fund balance. If we were to use $12 million, we're estimating to have a fund balance in the neighborhood of $60 million at the end of the fiscal year. And so if we took $12 million of that and uh, did the math in relation to the $746 million budget, it's about a 6.4% fund balance that would be remaining. We're estimating that additional state BEP revenue will be around $10 million increase, uh, which, which leaves uh, $4 million as the local revenue increase. And as you know, on the second page, and I'll advance this, um, the mayor's recommended funding level for the school district is 746.4 million. Uh, as Dr. Register just indicated, back on April 9th, the Board of Education approved a budget of 764.1 million, leaving the school district with about 17.7 million in reductions to make. And we discussed some of those in more general terms at the last uh, school board meeting. But if you would take, but if you would take the uh, bound document, which is. Uh, what the Board of Education approved back on April 9th, as it says on the front, and turn it over to the first page, which is the summary, uh, the summary of changes. And then if you would take the one pager that was also handed out to you, that at the top right says draft, and all caps, uh, May 28th, today's date. If you compare the two side by side, you, uh, as I go through this, you can see uh, some of the changes that are that we are planning to uh, discuss uh, this evening. Uh, and as a reminder regarding the process, uh, the process will be uh, a revised budget will be brought forward to the to the board, uh, to the board's budget and finance committee, uh, which is scheduled to meet on June 11th at four o'clock, uh, prior to the next board of education meeting, uh, where discussions uh, obviously can be held, and we can get down into the details of the changes or the revisions that are being recommended uh, for approval by the board, uh, either at the June 11th uh, board of education meeting or, uh, as we did last year, at the meeting in July. If we decide to wait until July, then the Board of Education will need to approve uh, what's called a continuation budget uh, at the June meeting so that we can continue to operate uh, post-June 30th if we want to uh, have a budget which would be approved after the fiscal year end, the current fiscal year ends. Uh, as we discussed at the last board meeting, uh, the biggest pieces of uh, looking at potential reductions are in the area of compensation. Uh, the proposal, as it stands today, is for there not to be a salary step increase for either certificated employees or our support employees. That's about a six and a half million dollar number. Uh, as you probably are aware, Metro General Government employees have not uh, had a step increment raise for four years uh, prior to this year. We also are looking at uh, making the state uh, teacher raise as the raise for both certificated employees and support employees. Uh, that one and a half percent raise on the teacher salary schedule is equivalent to a 1.12 percent raise on our higher teacher salary schedule. Uh, so a 1.12 percent raise uh, for certificated employees as well as for our support employees. 
Uh, those are the largest changes to the compensation area, and you can see if you compare the, the subtotals for employee compensation, uh, it's about a $9.5 million reduction uh, for uh, compensation. Going down the page, uh, staying uh, on the summary document, we are proposing to uh, include the 21 additional teachers for the additional student enrollment in the district uh, in our non-charter schools. Uh, we have been utilizing the uh, student, project, student enrollment projections that come from our student assignment office uh, as the Human Capital Division has sent out staffing allocations to our schools. Uh, schools have had those staffing allocations now for over a month. The, they have developed their master schedules, etc. so we have uh, done our best to try to maintain uh, both maintain the number of teaching positions that we have as well as include these additional teaching positions for the uh, projected student enrollment growth to maintain our current pupil teacher ratios. We have some reductions in the inflationary and other required expenditures, mainly where we had applied a, an inflationary factor to some of our maintenance of facilities accounts. Uh, we have uh, taken that inflationary factor off and we have reduced our maintenance uh, area uh, approximately, overall approximately $500,000 uh, in this budget. And we also have a slight reduction, as you'll see, on the charter schools. Uh, the Lead Prep Southeast, a new charter school, uh, had difficulty finding a location uh, to have uh, their new school, and so they had requested, and, and uh, the Office of Charter Schools had approved them using the band room and the choral room at Cameron uh, for the, Le for the uh, Leeds uh, Prep Southeast School as they begin operations next year, which in turn reduced the number of students that they were planning to educate from their original application. Also, uh, when we had a budget reduction, as we are preparing to have, uh, that slightly reduced the per pupil amount that would go to charter schools because, as you know, uh, the per pupil amount is based on total state and local revenue per student. And so the state and local revenue total amount that we are now looking at is, is actually less than what we were proposing, so we do have a slight reduction in the per pupil amount. So the charter school increase went from the $14.8 million down to around $14.2 million. So if you look in the middle part of the page, total additions um, under the, the draft for ton tonight's discussion, you'll see that the total additions uh, is $26.4 million, which is actually a little more than our additional funding as recommended by the mayor. The, the additional funding recommended by the mayor being a flat $26 million. So if you look at the bottom part of the page, what we've tried to do is basically anywhere that we were proposing an increase, we also had to identify a decrease somewhere else to make it work, to make the numbers balance. And so we had uh, several items that we had uh, previously included under proposed changes where we were looking to transition some of the initiatives that have been funded through the Federal Race to the Top grant we, had, we were trying to transition those out of that grant, which will end after next year, over to our local operating budget. And the decision was made, and as we re-looked at uh, the remaining funds uh, in the Race to the Top grant, the decision was made to go ahead and continue those, uh, basically those three items, one more year out of the Race to the Top grant. And those would be the Teach for America contract, the data warehouse positions, where we were phasing some of those positions into the operating budget, as well as the ESL endorsement program. Uh, those three things uh, we are now proposing to continue to fund out of the Race to the Top grant for one more year, knowing that after next year uh, that money will no longer be there and, and we will then need to, to transition everything that's being proposed, uh, any initiative out of the Race to the Top grant into another funding source. We've also decreased uh, or eliminated some of the increases that you saw uh, in the original $44 million uh, requested increase. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the reductions that we made are actually reductions to the increases that were requested. Um, but we also have a number of uh, flat out decreases where we are actually making reductions, particularly in the area of central office positions. Uh, uh, compared to the proposal that, that was approved by the board on April 9th, we are looking at uh, reducing central office positions by uh, 21 positions, 
21 in total. Uh, we didn't want to necessarily provide the detail relating to those positions this evening because there are individuals that are in those positions and they have not yet been notified that their positions will no longer be there. And so we will be bringing back the details of all of the position changes, which is actually document number two, uh, when we come back to you on June 11th in the Finance Committee meeting. We also, as you go down uh, the list of proposed changes at the bottom portion of the page uh, and you compare it to what was uh, approved back on April the 9th, you'll see again where some of the increases that were being requested are uh, completely, uh, are no longer included, such as the uh, five additional gifted and talented program teachers. Uh, we no longer are uh, proposing uh, the three additional school psychologists. Uh, we are no longer including. Um, going down the list, the uh, parent uh, outreach translators, we had originally requested five and a half, which was a reduction from what the department had requested. We are now requesting a, uh, a smaller number uh, of uh, parent outreach translators. And then uh, moving further down the list, the exceptional education teaching positions. We had originally requested five. We are now requesting three. And then the exceptional education, uh, educational assistance, we were requesting transitioning the 35 that previously were funded with federal stimulus funds plus five for student growth. We now are just proposing the 35 uh, that have been funded with the federal stimulus funding, which is uh, going away. Uh, we do have a couple of fairly large increases here. If you remember, uh, we had a listing of outstanding items where we were waiting on expenditure information from uh, Metro government, from the finance department. And uh, we did receive that information, but it was post uh, April 9th uh, board approval. Uh, so we knew we were going to have to include those in. We've listed out the, the two largest here, uh, the first being the employee injured on duty, which comes uh, from the Metro Employee Benefit Board. This is our portion of the IOD or injured on duty fund from the, uh, for our support employees from the Metro uh, Employee Benefit Board. And then also the property tax refund from uh, the MDHA properties that qualify for uh, uh, property tax refund based, being, based on being uh, in the uh, tax incremental uh, financing. And so those two together, you can see, are, are somewhere in the neighborhood of about a $1.2 million increase that we had to include in the budget. Uh, we did have a sizable uh, reduction with the debt service fund transfer. If you remember last year, uh, as part of the council's final budget approval, uh, the substitute budget ordinance included reducing the school district's operating budget by three and a half million dollars and transferring those funds over to the school district's debt service fund. We were unsure if that was something that was going to continue or if it was a one-time kind of thing. We found out after the board approved the budget, yes, if it was a one-time one thing, so we no longer will need to transfer three and a half million dollars from our local operating budget over to our debt service fund, so that can be reflected as a reduction. And then uh, various, which would include uh, lots of different types of positions, and as I said, uh, a number of central office positions, plus other expenditures throughout the budget, uh, which are captured in that various line. Again, all of those will be detailed uh, out for you uh, at the Budget and Finance Committee meeting on June 11th. Uh, for a reduction to the proposed changes uh, of about $425,000 to get down to the, uh, the $26 million increase or the $746.4 million uh, budget proposal. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the page, we originally, uh, the board originally was approving an additional 79 positions. Uh, that number has gone down by 41. Uh, so we're looking at an additional 38 positions with 21 of those being the additional teaching positions for projected student enrollment growth. And I'll ask Dr. Register if he wants to add anything to that. I think that's a good summary. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see if there are questions or observations at this point. Uh, it, it's a lot of information uh, and at, it's, I'm trying to compare it to 
what we looked at right. at our last meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you can, uh, the reduction to central office was before, two weeks ago, was 4.9 million. Mm -hmm. what, can you compare what you just said to what was given to us two weeks ago? The, uh what was given to you a couple of weeks ago was a, uh, an attempt to summarize uh, in uh, four different categories. The reduction to central office and other types of cost, it wasn't just positions, it was other costs as well. Those are, are pretty much the same. Uh, we, we did make some, uh, some revisions as we continued our discussions, but those pretty much uh, are the same. The big change from what was presented uh, two weeks ago is the fact that we are not proposing to reduce any teaching positions, except for the ones that I mentioned, which were the additional gifted and talented program teachers, the five, and the additional uh, exceptional education teaching positions, which we went from five down to three. Though, so those seven positions, um, those are the only ones that are being proposed to, uh, to be reduced at this point, whereas uh, in the original uh, discussion we had two weeks ago, it was uh, it was more in the neighborhood of 80 teaching positions. So that's one of the big changes uh, from the discussion two weeks ago. Uh, the rest of it, I think, is the same because the the previous discussion included the the freezing of the step increases as well as reducing the the raise from one and a half percent to 1.12 percent. Ms. Brown? Could you repeat what you said about the exceptional education assistance? We were going to increase the number, but now we're just staying at the number that we have now. What we're looking to do is to stay at the total number that we have now, uh, which we had uh, 35 of those were uh, funded uh, with federal stimulus funding, which is expiring. And so to be able to keep those 35 exceptional ed assistant positions, they, they would have to be transitioned over to the operating budget, which would be an increase. On top of that, the proposal was to add five more for student growth. Uh, and so in this iteration, we have chosen to not add any for student growth, but to just uh, just add the 35 that, uh, that were previously funded with expiring federal funds. I'm not sure where the cut should come from exactly, but, I, but that, that concerns me because I know we had to cut last year and that's been problematic, I think, in the schools and the teachers need a lot of help. And I, uh, my other concerns were just, um, just uh, you know, we need to make sure that we're the needs of our high-achieving students with the gifted uh, program, so. Well, and, and let me make sure that I'm clear here. The, these, these adjustments, revisions that you are presenting to us are um, in case Metro Council says, yes, we'll go with the mayor's recommended uh, increase of only $26 million. Right now, currently, the budget that we're going to present is a $764 million. Is that correct? That, that's my understanding is what's going okay. to be present, because presented because what, that's what the board what has the approved. Board has approved. Okay. So this is um, in case of. This is an overview of what could happen should Metro Council opt not to approve our initial budgeted request. Um, so it's interesting to me when I start looking at this where we're cutting. Um, we're bare bones as it is, and I don't think, if I remember correctly, uh, Mr. Pinkston and, and uh, Mr. Henson, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I don't believe that we had an overall major increase in our request on this current year's budget to begin with. It was not anything that was pie in the sky, let's shoot for the moon type of thing. Anything that we requested in here was in this budget was because there was a need. Um, so I just am, uh, and I clearly don't have a question, I'm sort of commenting here. Um, it is um, interesting to me that we continue to um, have to come back and consider making adjustments to our budget um, because in the end, you know, you, you look at the trickle-down effect and uh, it's going to affect learning for our children. Um, regardless of whether you think cutting uh, central office staff positions or not adding uh, teaching positions um, is going to not hurt our students at will because for every teaching position you cut, there's going to be an increase in students in a classroom and then you affect the learning for every single student in that classroom. So um, it's more of a little bit of a teeny tiny rant for me than anything else. So um, I just kind of wanted to make sure that we were clear on this, that this is a 
um, contingent <coughs> upon the Metro Council not adopting this budget. I've, I'm ranted out now. Anyone else have comments? I'd like to continue your ranting. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I just want to remind us. I know it's been said before, but. Our mission statement says that Metro Nashville Public Schools will provide every student with a foundation of knowledge, skills, and character necessary to excel in higher education, work, and life. Fundamental to our mission statement is every student, regardless of their ethnic, linguistic, or cultural heritage, regardless of their socioeconomic status, and regardless of their mobility practices, every student will become literate in our public schools fully prepared for a productive life after graduation, whether it be college or a trade. In other words, every student will have sufficient opportunities to become successful in life. It is our responsibility as a school board to ensure that each and every student receives meaningful instruction by outstanding teachers. I feel strongly that we must improve our professional development for teachers. But even with outstanding support for our teachers, some students need interventions. I have received a sneak preview of the literacy scores. And um, for, the, for our students uh, that just received, that just took the TCAP assessment, and apparently our literacy scores are stagnant this year, looking at the overall picture. And they're not improving. Uh, I've been working, as Jay said, with the Elementary Literacy Committee and uh, they will be proposing a comprehensive literacy framework by the end of June. And it's my hope that in this budget we'll, we will be able to fully fund the committee's recommendations. But with this latest proposal, with seven teaching positions being cut, 6.5 million freeze in salary steps, yet another 1.8 reduction in salary increase, um, students appear, teachers appear to be taking the brunt of the, of the cuts whereas four million only are being reduced from central office. Uh, from my vantage point, the proposed budget is still heavy on the administrative side. If we cut positions and interventions that support our literacy efforts, it may potentially jeopardize the very mission that we have adopted to ensure that all students are prepared for college and career. I know the doctor register and none of us want to stay tonight and delve deeply into this budget. Uh, but I do look forward to June the 11th when we can uh, examine carefully each line item in this budget to ensure that we hold strong to our mission statement and provide exemplary education for every student in Nashville. Thank you. Any other comments? I once again will say that uh, it is going to be essential uh, that if you can attend the uh, Metro Council budget hearing on Thursday, that you be there because this is our budget and clearly we have a lot at stake here. Um, so I will turn it back over to Mr. Henson, Dr. Register. Unless anyone has any questions. Well, I do. Sorry, I know it's seven. Oh, but, that's okay. Um, I think all that makes sense and I agree with your point about the central office. And it sounds like that what you were saying though, Mr. Henson, is that it's not going to be 4.09 million anymore. He said that had really not changed. That hadn't, yeah. That was a, uh, that 4.09 million was a combination of several different things. Um, and so I think it'll be easier to see once, once we have all of the documents updated with the recommendation from the administration to be able to see what, uh, uh, what's being proposed as far as changes go. Um, and so, when you look at that particular category based upon two weeks ago, uh, overall that hasn't necessarily changed, but there were lots of different pieces included in there, not, as I said, not just positions, but programma programmatic kinds of things were included in there as well, and there was no way to actually get into the detail on, a, on that uh, quarter of a PowerPoint slide. Although and so, what is the actual comparative number then? I, understanding that a bunch of things are bucketed in the 4.09, like what is it now? I didn't use the same. I didn't use the same comparison. Got it. Okay, but in terms of actual positions, it sounds like the total number of actual that. central office type positions, as I said, from what was approved back on April 9th, the reduction of central office positions is 21, and that is basically the same as what was presented a couple of weeks ago. Got it. Um, so my only other thought is. 
I mean, right, I mean, all of us want as many resources and as much money as we can, particularly at the classroom level, um, where it directly impacts students. I don't think in a perfect world that would be the case. Um, and certainly places like Newark, they're spending $24,000 per year per student. And so, and, and we are not angry at that. Um, it's also true, though, that it, 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 like when I think about the budget broadly, I guess I'm just still, and I keep saying variations of this in different ways, but I, I, I question, I guess, the fundamental like wisdom of assuming that nothing else is up for grabs in terms of switches, cuts, adjustments, um, except what's new, basically new. And then some of the stuff that just isn't non-negotiable, like we just know we have to, we're going to have to pay for it. Um, but you know, there's you know literally hundreds of millions of dollars of spending that we're assuming should just continue as is. Um, so this is not going to be solved in the short term. I think just that approach to the budget. But I just feel so strongly, like if we all are. I think what I'm hearing from you, um, Jill, is that you want to see as much of the funding go straight to this classroom as possible. I do too, um, and that we've got to figure out ways to. And I'm guessing that a lot of us probably would agree in different ways, and that's what you're saying with, um, um, sorry, this um, gifted, G yes, yes, gifted and talented kids too, um, and so and it's impossible to get to that level. I mean, it's impossible even to assess when we don't even discuss basically hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of spending. It's just assumed that the way it's been done is how it's going to be done, and so yes, we get to this point where then it does boil down to 20 million here, 20 million dollars, which is a lot. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not within a 760 million dollar proposed budget, and so I think just yeah. Fundamentally, I feel like we just have to stop and examine all that post this cycle. Um, well, and let me just say too, that's why we have budget and finance committee meetings, so that we can delve deeper into this. No, I, it yeah. could be that we need to start the process a little sooner to go a little bit deeper into this process, but that's exactly what that, that committee is for, is to get into the details and say, why are we doing this? Is there a possibility that we could move this to this? Is there, do we really need this particular program over this program? So that's the opportunity for this board to delve, delve deeper into this process. And it could be um, that we start the process a little bit sooner so that we will all have an opportunity to get a little bit deeper. But at the point that we are now, you're absolutely right, it's a little late in the process to even start thinking about it. But going forward is definitely something to consider. Um, if we have questions about uh, you're right, if it's the overall, we're looking at a $700 million budget every year and we're only making adjustments to just a, and I say this in such a weird way, a few million, like it's $5. <laughs> <laughs> if we're only looking at a, changing a few million, then maybe we need to look at the overall process. So that's something that we should consider for our next budgeting season for sure. That's a very good point. And I'll just add, and I don't disagree at all, I'll just add that when we, when we say hundreds of millions of dollars, um, of course, it's all laid out in, in document number eight, which is the line item budget, which shows every single account right. broken down by functional area. By far the largest uh, functional area in the budget is teachers, teacher salaries and benefits, Absolutely. teacher positions, as it, as it should be. Uh, and we have uh, pupil-teacher ratios that are required by state law to meet. Uh, we also have uh, large uh, numbers of uh, positions in some of the other areas that are school-based. Um, librarians and counselors and principals and assistant principals and school office, et cetera. So if we're looking at those big kinds of things, we're talking mainly about the groups of positions that are out in the schools uh, because, uh, as I've said before, over 80 percent of our budget's labor and the vast majority of that's out in schools and the vast majority of that is teachers. And so um, I'm perfectly fine with, with starting the, the process earlier and in the year and with uh, delving deeper into it. Uh, if we wanted to go ahead and, uh, and begin some of those discussions mid-year, we could uh, as we look at the individual accounts within that line item budget, if there are some areas of, of concern or some areas that warrant uh, further discussion, uh, be glad to do that. And again, it goes back to what I said, I mean, when you start affecting the number of teachers you have in a classroom, you start to affect the uh, learning in a classroom. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult when you look at a budget um, that is, what is it, 80% um, staffing. Uh, it's difficult to, to try to look at that and say, well, let's just slash this. But again, I'll go back to, um, it's something that we may just, it may just be a matter of having more time to 
dig a little deeper into it to see what it is we're, we're proving. So, any other questions? Well, since it's 708, Ms. Frog, you have the floor. There being no further business, we'll take it.